Living Room Logic. Welcome to Living Room Logic, a place for you to chill out and have a laugh with two scientists who know too much about very, very little. This episode, we dive into the nature of love, how animals have evolved weird ways to find it, and why deep down we're all just promiscuous apes. Be my everything and follow the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Come find us on Instagram or Twitter or other social media that your ex still sends you drunk messages on. Sit back and enjoy the endorphins rush to follow. Hello, all you lovely people. Uh, Before we start this podcast, we just want to mention two things. First, just a heads up that this episode gets a bit explicit at times. Uh, in a funny way, so it might not be the best for those with a delightfully innocent heart. Secondly, we want to acknowledge the massive elephant in the room, that this podcast is not really about humans, and most of what we talk about is heterosexual female-to-male behaviours in nature. Most of the research on sex in nature is heterosexually focused. This doesn't equate to people, because we are polyamorous and Human love comes in all shapes, sizes, and directions. That's just our nature. So keep that in mind as you listen to these tales of love on forest floors to ocean depths. Welcome back, everyone, to Living Room Logic, a place for you to chill out and have a laugh with me and my boy, Andrew. Hey. This week, we're going to talk to you about love Mm. and how different animals in the animal kingdom and how they perceive love and how love manifests itself in the world. The real nature of love. (laughs) So we actually decided to change it up a bit this week and Andrew is going to start off with a beautiful story time and, you know, just everyone sit down and get comfy because Andrew's going to blow your minds. Welcome, everybody. On this Valentine's Day week, I think that this is a good time to give you love tips, what to look out for, and stories from the world of nature that maybe you can take something from. Mm. So let me begin. In the rainforest, there is a disco. Imagine a shopping centre where ladies can mosey around, minding their business. However, every now and then, there's a dark spot, and suddenly a spotlight on a particularly striking male bird of paradise. Mm. Some are hopping and skipping to swoon you. Others are pole dancing. (laughs) Some are building weird and intricate structures to show you that they could build you a home. You also have the pretty boys showing off their flair, bright and yellow feathers, maybe showing off a scarf they made all by themselves that glitters in shining turquoise. Does that sound like a bit much, ladies? You're not the only one. Most of the time, the female birds are just minding their own damn business. And they spot some geezer trying to put on a show. <laughs> as, is, as is life, I suppose. That's story one. Aw, that was beautiful. Pole dancing birds. Oh, it's... There's much to go. <laughs> Ladies, it isn't just some humans that like to get dolled up. No, in fact, there are insects who want to smell their best. But be warned, lads. Often there are traps behind beautiful people. The female praying mantis, in fact, smells amazing, releasing pheromones that males simply cannot ignore, like your favourite smell, for some cinnamon and for others petrol. The male mantis is now blinded by lust for the illustrious female mantis. We've all been there, not thinking clearly. Lads, when you actually get close to the female praying mantis love interest, She will literally bite your head off. (laughs) I'm telling you, 60% of these females' diet is eating males. When they're in the mood, they actually make more babies if they eat males. So folks, always keep an eye out for red flags like a graveyard of male corpses inside of your love interest's bedroom. Oh my god. That was beautiful. Now number three. God, men are disgusting. They are. A girl is trying to walk from A to B and she keeps getting unwanted attention. Some guys just don't let up. If you were the red garter snake, this is an all too familiar kind of hell. Sure, she wanted to smell good today, but she doesn't want the whole world coming at her. The poor lady snake's minding her own business 
when she could have up to a hundred males going after her. This orgy is actually has a name. It's called a mating ball. Yes, hundreds of snakes rolling up into a ball, all trying to mate with this one poor female garter snake. Delightful. I hope she at least gets them to pay for dinner. Oh my god. Wow. Now, a fourth one. Fourth tip of the day from from my love treasure chest. It's never nice to wonder if you are the clingy one. This is especially true for the deep sea anglerfish, the ones with the lights hanging off their head. The lady anglerfish is looking for love. She wants to be a mommy anglerfish, releasing her pheromones and flashing her lights to signal the boys to line up and give their best lines. However, sometimes you need a few dates to get to know someone. A male anglerfish is smaller than a lady anglerfish and knows how to take advantage of her broodiness. When he gets close enough, he will literally bite into her belly, hold on, and fuse with the lady anglerfish. From here, the male anglerfish will offer the lady sperm so she can be a mommy, as long as she will give him nutrients for his existence in their now connected blood supply. So, ladies, keep an eye out for clinging male anglerfish, which show that the benefits of patriarchal structure for parasitic males to exist in the deepest of deep blues. <laughs> that is beautiful. Now tip number five. Oh my god, well, there's more? This is more of a story, right? Ugh. PDA. The worst, right? Public displays of affection, right? I can't, I just can't deal with it. What happens in the bedroom between two consenting adults is their business, but I don't want to see it. Like the last day, I was bopping around the Amazon, minding my own business, when bam, on a branch, where it's just two parrots absolutely necking each other. Oh, you think I'm being dramatic that they were just giving each other, you know, a little peck on the beak, you know, all cute little parrots? No. They were literally trying to ring the bell at the back of each other's throat. <laughs> Ugh. You know what then happened? And yes, I should have stopped staring, but how can you not look? It was so shocking. The lad legitimately vomited into her mouth mm. mid-shift. Mm -hmm. And she fecking ate it. She ate it. What in the holy mercy of the Virgin Mary was that? Get a room, or at least a branch that's not at eye level. Thanks. <laughs> and now number six. Oh my God. To end it, to end it on a lighter note. Aww. I will always love you. It's a phrase from many movies. One person about to go to war, leaving the others behind. Maybe their partner has to follow their dreams. This is true for the albatross. These giant birds are world travelers, but no matter how far they fly, love will always bring them back together. The albatross may leave the nest for up to five years without returning, but when it does, these lovers will enjoy a 20-minute dance together to celebrate the return. They will stay with the egg and the baby for a year until it is ready to leave the roost, as will mom and dad. But don't be concerned. In due time, mom and dad albatross will return and dance again. Oh, that was actually very nice. And there's my stories for Valentine's Day. Andrew, yeah. that was beautiful. Oh. That whole section. There was some weird stuff going on. Pole dancing. Well, you know. Head We tried beating. to end on a high note. Yeah, well, think of the albatross if you want to be in a good mood, but there's some really funky stuff. Carving. Bang. Yeah, the parrots are weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also, bit... the, the, the albatrosses are crazy. Yeah. They're these huge things as well. They have a wingspan of like... Two meters. Yeah, man, they're huge. And the fact that they go off for months on end and yeah, there's some crazy stuff on albatrosses as well. And, you know, BBC stuff. It's absolutely incredible. Hmm. So to contrast that beautiful story that you just gave, Andrew, I should try and at least contrast it with other ways that Mother Nature has given animals strange body parts. Well, everyone likes a good body part. And in nature, it's kind of difficult to find love, but not very difficult, as you showed, to find love making. That Ooh, really la, la. is nature's show of love. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the closest you'll ever get. 
Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. And maybe it's a, a unique thing of humans, but, you know, I want to give some some examples of how animals have evolved these weird and wacky genitalia. The evolutionary drive to make love was what brought them here. And mm. turns out weird genitalia are exceptionally normal in nature. Oh, oh great. Insects, mammals, fish, spiders and snails, they all have unique forms of wangas. Oh, and just to think of all of the scientists that discovered these and how they went about it. Fair play to them. <laughs> yeah. Fair play to them. <laughs> to all those strange scientists. <laughs> well done. Picking, picking up a cat's tail. Or a snail's tail. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a snail out of a shell to only be horrified. <laughs> but it actually turns out that in the animal kingdom, no other organs evolve faster than genitalia. And it's oh. because of some stuff that we'll talk about later. But awesome. to start you off with this strange thing that has happened in nature, uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about ducks. And... Oh. I like ducks. Ducks aren't the craziest looking. We see no. them all the time in our rivers and yeah. ponds. It's even in the mm -hmm. city. They're bopping mm -hmm. about eating bits, eating all your bread. But uh, there's a secret that ducks have lying beneath their mid-region feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and turns I out wonder that, what it is. <laughs> turns out that uh, male ducks have very long and explosive penises and uh, uh, they are shaped uh, like a corkscrew like just the tip of the corkscrew or like the whole no, thing the you whole use to get corkscrew. the corkscrew uh, oh they're also barbed today i learned that you can use a duck's penis as a bottle opener exactly very, very good <laughs> i'm drinking wine right now so if only you had a duck yeah. around oh yeah would have saved you hassle earlier <laughs> and we'll talk about how this evolved later but mm. Weirdly enough, female ducks have an anti-clockwise corkscrew vagina. And oh. ducks usually have a clockwise corkscrew penis. So there's this battle going on, actually, between male and female ducks for, for mating and who has the control over fertilization. That being when sperm and eggs meet to form a, okay. a tiny little zygote or a little tiny yeah, yeah. baby cell. A little baby, a little baby cell. So we will get back to that and we'll get back to why all these weird kind of things happen. But some other normal examples. Marsupials and sharks. So marsupials being kangaroos and co in Australia. Sharks and rays and skates, all sorts of cartilaginous fish in the sea. Mm -hmm. They all have two sets of genitalia. What, like a spare? Like double. Oh. So they have oh. two penises and the females have two vaginas. And it's the same with uh, marsupials and kangaroos. And the only reason they do it is because every time they mate, they use both at the same time and it doubles the chance of fertilization. And so Jesus. for the case of kangaroos, what happens is if both are fertilized, one is reabsorbed and the other is invested in, in the body. Whereas with sharks, okay. both can be fertilized and so they can have a large set of children using both, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. They'd want really good dexterity to get them both in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the weirdest thing is that... Oh, it gets weirder, cool. I've, I've done lots of time at sea on research vessels for my research. And... Mm -hmm. Is this going to be an Aiden Alone story? It's... <laughs> <laughs> Long time out on sea. <laughs> and there even, was even the female shark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... On these surveys, you need to uh, identify the sex of all of the things that come up in these uh, fishing trawls. And okay. for the case of the shark, for the males, they have these two little sticky outy things called claspers. And <laughs> and then they become quite large and the male ones, of course. Um, okay. And the females don't have that. So that's how you can differentiate them. Wow. So, yeah, that was fun. Wow. <laughs> A unique experience. So, 
Some South American crane flies have a washboard-like attachment on their penises that they make a song out of while they mate. If the female likes it, she will allow fertilisation to happen. If she doesn't like this washboard sound, then she doesn't. I thought if she liked the washboard, she'd just take out her banjo breasts and start dong ding 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 and they'd start playing some, yeah, yeah, some, you know, some real Mississippi banjo washboard shenanigans going on there. A lot of these are insects, which is an interesting point. You know, they just keep popping up. So some beetles have drumsticks on the sides of their penises that they drum on the female while they mate to make a soothing song for her. So insects are very musical, especially during the act, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's so strange. Yeah, and, and so it's like a lot of different species of beetles have these different sort of, I wouldn't say pleasurable attachments, but it's just to in some way make their performance more memorable for the female and we will talk about how this happens um, pretty soon but actually one way that the female controls which sperm to use and fertilize is they actually Mm -hmm. have evolved these pockets that can store sperm and they're called spermatheca and so insects female insects can mate with several different male insects and then decide which sperm to use after the fact wow which is kind of interesting. A little filing system. Exactly. They have a little file explorer that we, they just open up and they're like, oh, mail three. He was a good one. He has really <laughs> good rhythm. So really, this is like an evolutionary arms race between mm. males and females for that control of fertilization. And, and so there are actual ways that, that males combat those sort of things in females and so for instance like a male black widow spider has a disposable penis tip that after entering the female actually blocks sperm of its rivals no way so there's ways that they can then say well even if the female has spermatheca those extra storage places Mm -hmm. that well this is the only sperm that is going to enter any of those Wow. And so the arms race continues and actually it comes to a kind of climax way when <laughs> male bed bugs bypass the entire thing and um, by literally having a, a, a syringe like penis that they inject into the stomach of female bed bugs. So they bypass the whole thing and they just stab into the belly of the female. By bypass, you mean? Yeah, right by, by bypass, I mean assault. Yeah. So Literally just stabby, stabby. Bed bugs are, are pretty, pretty terrible dudes. Oh but this God, whole phenomenon awful. of this arms race between males and females, especially in insects, uh, but also in, in other species, and I'll talk about other ones, is this phenomenon known as sexual selection. And it's a phenomenon that actually the very famous evolutionary biologist Charles Darwin came up with back in the 1850s, I think. But before we talk about sexual selection, we need to talk about natural selection. Everyone has heard of natural selection. Maybe they might not fully know what it is. It's the survival of the fittest. And if you evolve a trait that is making you better at adapting to the environment you're in, you will survive and you will have children and those children will likely have that trait as well, right? That's the way natural Mm -hmm. selection works. Well, sexual selection works differently. Sexual selection depends not on a struggle for existence, but on a struggle between the males for possession of the females. The result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. In a layman's term, really, what sexual selection is, is... A branch of natural selection and has nothing to do with animals' adaptability to an environment. It's more so to do with just mating and just get being being more attractive to females. Uh, that's how it usually works. It's female choice and male competition. Okay? Mm. What happens is it creates things like dichromatism. It's a thing where males... Uh, tend to vary in colour a lot from females, but also a thing called sexual dimorphism, 
which is where males become much larger than females or they have a completely different physical look than females. All right. Mm -hmm. And so males start competing massively for females uh, choosing them and they start growing things like ornaments and perfect examples have already been given by Andrew. These pole dancing birds of paradise that are doing whatever they can to get a female to to just see them. Yep. Trying and, to get their attention. And so other things like a, a perfect example is a peacock and its tail feathers. And the peacock is a perfect example of sexual selection that's almost nearly gone too far until it became actually detrimental to that species. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a thing called runaway selection when it kind of is going on this exponential, this upward trajectory where it's really taking over them yeah. actually adapting to their environment. So like you look at a peacock and you're like, here, man, you need to calm down. You have this <laughs> humongous ornament on your arse and you yeah. flick it up and a tiger just goes, oh, man, lunch, unreal. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. It makes know? them so because it, it would make them more easy to spot. No doubt. Absolutely. And they make these massive noises and these big uh, mating behavioural dances Mm. and courtship calls and everything. So it's a it's a bit of a disaster. Right. Yeah. And so we notice that sexual selection is actually stronger in species where parental care is heavily skewed to one sex. So usually it's the female um, Mm -hmm. in nature. I'm saying yeah. that we f- we see that females tend to take care of offspring more and that actually pushes males to compete even more because that's really okay. the only thing that they can do to improve yeah. their chances. So wow. there's one amazing example uh, and one that actually I studied back in college, which is really funny, oh, yeah. but I actually wrote an essay about this years ago and I'm actually oh going to I'm going to read you an excerpt from that. So hopefully, oh, class. hopefully that's at all uh, uh, descriptive. But I hope you didn't fail this essay. Yeah, I hope I didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> question. No, I don't think I did. I was pretty happy with it, but that was uh, five years ago. So here we go. Yeah. OK. There's this huge lake in Africa called Lake Victoria. OK. And there's this type of fish. It's not really crazy memorable. It's called a cichlid. And they're just these pretty small fish that kind of vary in colour. And yeah, if you saw saw one, you'd be like, that's a pretty normal looking fish. But for some reason, there's 1,500 different species of them in this one lake. What? And sexual selection was the massive player in why that variability in species happened why that radiation is what it's called happened and they actually know that the lake was dry about 15,000 years ago so Mm. that rate of speciation is massive especially when you compare it to like humans who our species evolved about 300,000 years ago yeah and sure we've we're pretty much exactly the same yeah we might have a different bone in our wrist or something do you know what I mean yeah yeah that's it that's so fast So the way that this works, and I'll just give like an example, like a a hypothetical situation, okay? Mm -hmm. Imagine a slightly cloudy lake with two layers, okay? The first layer is the top half of the water column where blue light is most abundant. The second layer is the bottom half of the water column, which is much darker and red light is the only light source available. This is a normal natural phenomenon, okay? It happens in lakes and the ocean. A species of cichlid fish has recently inhabited the lake. Okay. Random genetic mutations give rise to males who vary in colour. Through natural selection, females who dwell in the shallow layer will visualise blue light more effectively as it's more abundant. So they'll see blue light more. Okay. Yeah. Females who dwell in the deep layer will visualise red light more effectively as it's the Mm -hmm. only feckin' light source. Over time, females will tend to mate with brighter, more attractive males. So sexual selection begins to take effect when males that are blue and dwell in the shallow layer will will mate more frequently and their blue trait will be reinforced generation by generation. Oh, my God. So you start getting blue, more blue and more blue males in the shallow layer. A similar phenomenon in the deep layer will reinforce the cichlids there to become more and more red, or at least the males. Reproductive isolation begins to occur 
the fish in the shallow layer don't interact with fish in the deep layer and there you go you have two different species and this isn't even a hypothetical situation because it actually happened there's two species yeah. one that's red and one that's blue and this oh happened God. because of the, the changes in light so right in this situation you have natural selection and sexual selection working because wow. natural selection is working on the whole species availability to see either red or blue light yeah and then the females choosiness pushes the males yeah, yeah. to become the certain color it's really cool that's amazing i suppose at different depths there's different light that you can reflect so it does make perfect sense that fish at a deeper depth if you're a certain color that benefits you but if you're shallow a different colour benefits you. Like, for instance, a lot of fish in the very deep sea, a couple thousand metres deep, mm -hmm. they're all red because the red light is absorbed. That's natural selection. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in this lake, that choosiness of the female pushed the males to become red in the deep and blue in the shallow. It's very cool and it's, it's based on a, a, a pair of real species. It's so interesting to talk about it from the point of view of nature and animals and, you know, how they choose their mate. And then when you kind of, you know, we'll reel it back a little bit to hum humans and uh, us lonely folks with a podcast out on, on Valentine's week, you know, <laughs> uh, and the way that humans go through, you know, sexual selection. And I suppose we're a bit more complex, aren't we? Because we're, you know looking for love <laughs> we're looking for the person that will complete you the person that will pick you up when you're down and uh, I think because everything you were talking about there is kind of like a, it's it's driven by by lust you know it's an attractiveness yeah. how attracted are you to this person you're already driven to mate and now it's a battle of who can be the most attractive um but when we're talking about love, it's a different thing and it's not something in the fishy fish kingdom. Yeah. So much as it is, it like it's quite complex. And like for us, we thrive on attachment as a species. Like it could be attachment to your things and keeping your things safe so you can, you know, hold on to them and make them keep you happy. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, attachment to silly things like your family and loved ones. <laughs> um, but like it, it is true, like... Um, it's pretty fundamental to humanity right now that you are you're attached to your children. You 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 love them. You know, it's a it's a biological thing. You love them and you want to raise them to be their best so they can go out and win the great race of sexual selection and pass down your genes, mm -hmm. right? But like there's so many different kinds of these attachments. You could have attachments like this to your friends other members of family and it's cool how biologically driven this is because a lot of us think that um we consciously make the decision of saying aiden i choose you you're my pikachu no. <laughs> you know yeah but in reality uh, there's a bit of a biological drive in there that actually helps that drives me to maintain a friendship Mm -hmm. And it's driven by two uh, neurotransmitters, chemicals in the brain called oxytocin and vasopressin, right? Um, they're released in the hypothalamus and a few other places. And oxytocin is, you know, you'd see it sold to you as the love drug. Hmm. In reality, it's more of the, the cuddle drug. It's not quite like, oh, this person will fall for me and all that. It's much more of a cuddle drug. It's much more of a helping you feel secure with someone. Yeah. Like, like for examples, the places that oxytocin is mainly released is during sex, childbirth, and breastfeeding. Right? So, not necessarily enjoyable experiences. Um, <laughs> you know, pu pushing childbirth in there kind of skews the graph. But what you can say is that they're all experiences which are a prerequisite to bonding. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to sleep with someone, there's a mo there's there is a high likelihood that afterwards you might be attached to them. Not mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. but 
you know, biologically it's going, right, well, try to keep this person around to help help you out with a pregnancy or, gosh, I should look after this person so when they have my child, I can make sure that child grows up and passes on my genes. Mm -hmm. So they are all to do with bonding. And the other one, vasopressin, right, it's involved in building this bond and making you behave in a way that is in the best interest of you both as a couple. Let's say our interest, Aiden. We have great vasopressin activity going on because we're working together to raise a podcast. That's beautiful. And our little our, baby podcast. Oh, and it's going to be gorgeous. It's oh, going to be that, absolutely gorgeous. That That is kind of where the... <laughs> Attachment comes in and, you know, and I think in a lot of ways that attachment is what we call love. Um, mm -hmm. But love also is a coming together of all of these things, isn't it? How can you love someone like someone you want to spend your life with if you're not attracted to them? If you're not a bit lustful towards them? Mm -hmm. And I think that is beautiful. No, I think that... <laughs> <laughs> and you're a genius. No. Yeah, <laughs> I think that is interesting. But I think Aiden might have something else to say about it because you'd think of humans would probably have always been like that. But that might not be the case, Aiden, is it? No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and turns out for about 95% of the time that humans have been on this lovely earth, that we have actually been what is called promiscuous. Uh -huh. And that kind of just means having many sexual or emotional partners. Again, it's a, a change in our situation. Not really an evolutionary thing at all. I mean, there's probably research in that. But it's more of a, an adaptability to an environmental change. Uh -huh. And so just to be clear here that monogamy is the opposite, really, of promiscuity. In that okay. you have one sexual or emotional partner. It's really used more towards marriage. So it's not really a natural okay. thing even. You can't really use it in the animal kingdom, in the rest of the yeah. animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. No other animal seems to really do it. There are yeah. a couple animals um, like swans that they have. Yeah. They kind of have mating pairs that, that last decades. Yeah. The albatross as well. The albatross uh, as I said. is very similar. And also, another example is those really dirty parrots I was talking about with too much PDA and vomiting into each other's mouths and shifting the face off each other. They it's also do cute. that for life. So yeah. there are mm. examples, but they're very far, few and in between. So yeah. how do we know, though, that humans were promiscuous and not monogamous before? Yeah. And like the thing is, from all fossil evidence, we know that humans modern humans evolved around 300,000 years ago. Okay. For most of that time up until about 10 or 12,000 years ago, which I'll talk about that moment in history in a second. But humans were pretty much tribal hunter-gatherers. Okay. And they practice a thing called egalitarianism, which is just everyone kind of shares things. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Even in terms of children, that would have been the case. The ways that we know about this and kind of the most solid ways that we know about this is actually from explorers in the kind of uh, 17th and 18th century or maybe even earlier. They would go to other countries that hadn't been colonized yet and there would be native tribes there. Yeah. And they would just observe these native tribes and they would try and learn from them. And there was a story of a French navigator. He was in this uh, South American tribe. He kind of was weirded out by the fact that that tribe just shared mates and there were no single monogamous relationships. Mm -hmm. And the tribe thought it was really strange that there would be. Yeah. And and when he asked them, well, would are you not jealous that, you know, someone else is mating with the person that you just had your child with he's like well that's not my child that's the tribe's child and that's the way that they think about it okay so it's an it's a tribal community that takes care of all of the children 
together. There's a part of the brain that's involved in ownership mm -hmm. where the moment something belongs to you, it's worth more. OK, it kind of goes back to the attachment thing. I remember reading before, right, there was this experiment that you put these babies into a room, right? And you gave them an option. Do you want the mug or do you want the chocolate? And they could choose the mug or the chocolate and it would be theirs. And they were babies. It was a 50-50 split. They didn't fully get it. Like, they, I don't know, I think they were about two to three, something like that. Yeah. Then there was a second stage, right, where the students that were given the mug were offered ch the chocolate. They said, you can trade it if you want. You know, do you want this shot? And they said no. And then there was another one where the students with the chocolate, they were like, do you want the mug? And then they were like, no. So there was this thing of like, once you have it, it's it's worth more to you. This mug is better than your chocolate because it's mine. Mm -hmm. And they did the same experiment in a uh, one of those untouched tribes. And they were happy to switch it around and they didn't really care yeah. at all. Yeah, they, it wasn't something that they had in their brain to uh, have that added value to something that belonged to them. So is the idea that they've evolved that or is it just an environmental thing? Well, I, I don't know if it's uh, if they evolved it mm -hmm. or if they never evolved out of it. Did mm -hmm. we develop it or did they get out of it? Yeah, it's hard to know, you know. The, so there are other ways as well, though, like kind of biological, physical ways of looking at the size of males versus females in, fos mm -hmm. in the fossil record for humans. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, th that first bit of evidence is, is kind of potentially misleading because of what you just said there. But there, the old, other ways that we know is that our closest relatives are actually... Uh, chimps and bonobos which are two yeah. apes because we are apes as well we are from the ape lineage and both chimps and bonobos are extremely promiscuous they okay. like to mate and they mate with lots of different mates very frequently <laughs> especially bonobos they'll do okay. it to say hello they'll do it to say goodbye they'll do it to say how are you getting on they just right. really enjoy it okay so we look at our ancestors and, and the thing is as well is that in terms of how close we are in evolution to yeah, them, yeah. we're very yeah. close. We're more closely related to chimps and bonobos than African elephants are to Indian elephants. So you can kind of, we're very, very similar oh, in our right. genetics. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, wow. So we kind of share similar physical traits that um, you know, chimps and bonobos also do that play towards this theory of us being promiscuous and another term is that we competed for giving our sperm. It's called sperm competition. Okay? Yeah. Uh, one thing is, as I said, body dimorphism, which is that males are about 25% larger than females. This is exactly the same in chimps and bonobos and even gorillas. Uh, if you compare things like the testicle size of chimps, bonobos and gorillas, humans are actually relatively larger than gorillas. So, okay. you know, and it's quite similar to like chimps and bonobos have huge testicles that are much bigger than humans. But you can see that there is a gradient there that mm. maybe we're intermediate. Yeah, yeah. So... If you compare kind of like the human penis size compared to the penis sizes of these other apes as well, it totally plays towards this thing of sperm competition. The actual shape of the human penis is really different from that of other chimps in that the the human pe penis actually creates a vacuum in the vagina that pulls out sperm of competitors. So something right. that people probably have never known, but we have evolved that trait and chimps and bonobos don't even have that. So clearly we're competing for giving mm -hmm. our sperm to to female to females. Sorry. So we, we would have we would have evolved that under the thing of that. We would be expecting there to already be sperm there that we were competing with, mm -hmm. which would be a signal of promiscuity. Exactly. Wow. It sounds a bit mad, but it, it is pretty interesting. Yeah, it's amazing. Other things 
only chimps, bonobos and human females vocalize during sex. It's only in those three species. And so wow. that is again a kind of thing of competition. So that other males yeah. know that it's happening. No way. Yeah. So again, a, a very promiscuous style thing to do. That's so interesting. The only two species to have front-facing sex are bonobos and humans. Again, maybe is it a bonding thing? But really, you know, we're very similar to these guys who seem to just love riding, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so very interesting. <laughs> um, the last thing really is just, look, the frequency of sexual activity in humans compared to chimps and bonobos is, is just as high. So yeah. I think bonobos are slightly higher, but humans are definitely up there. So it's just like we seem to really like to do it. So um, chances are because of all those things that we were promiscuous in the past. Yeah, yeah, man. But now we know that we're monogamous because because that's the way that a lot of people in the world think now. Yeah. And it's kind of even strange to for many people to even think about being promiscuous or being uh, what is termed now for humans is termed polyamorous. Just having yeah, yeah. Um, several sexual or emotional partners. So it's really mm -hmm. interesting. And there's a couple of different moments in history that really brought us to this monogamous present. Wow. One being about 10 or 12,000 years ago, humans started farming. And... This is called the Neolithic Revolution. So once we start farming, humans have a finite amount of land and it actually yeah, makes yeah. more sense to invest energy into a smaller number of children. And so the accumulation of wealth, it creates a split of monogamous and polygamous societies. Wow. This starts a rift in the kind of start of this monogamous history jump about seven and a half thousand years to ancient Greece and the Greeks again they really think about democracy they create democracy but yeah. with democracy they actually create marriage and monogamy that's mad and the fusing of of different families and 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 you know bringing together families for either political or for reasons of the actual people being in yeah, quotations yeah. love. Of and course, so yeah. this improved the 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 Greek people's sense of citizenship and, and social cohesion. So that really helped their society. Wow. Again, you move another three hundred years, what happens? The Roman Empire starts and begun begins to spread across um most of the the you know the known world being being most of Europe and into Eurasia. Mm -hmm. And again they steal a lot of Greek culture because <laughs> the Greeks they liked the way that the yeah, Greeks yeah. did it and another thing that they uh, well what that comes after is after the Romans adopt this Greek culture they're, they're actually really good at enforcing it as law because the Romans are particularly good at their their um, creating laws and enforcing them okay. so monogamy becomes even more of a normal thing in, in society. Jump another kind of 2,000 years and Jesus Christ is put on a cross and Christianity is started. And that spreads like wildfire across the world. And so the Christians adopt monogamy from Roman culture and that's pretty much the biggest thing to happen for monogamy in that it's just spread okay. all around the world. Right. And the kind of last nail in the coffin for promiscuity <laughs> is in the 1800s that the Industrial Revolution happens. The shift to urban society, this kind of technological and economic expansion uh, and this massive drop in child mortality mm -hmm. means that it actually makes more sense to just have a couple kids and invest your time and energy into those in them definitely going to survive and take on after you. Mm -hmm. So this thing was known as the fertility transformation during the Industrial Revolution. And right, so, yeah, yeah it, it pretty much pays to, to invest in a smaller number of children. 
next thing you know, everyone's going all around the world, taking over the place with European mm-hmm. colonialism. Yeah. And the rest is history, man. Over the last 200 years, has monogamy really been widespread? You know, wow. China and Japan in the last 200 years, they were had polygamous societies before that. But really, you know, 200 years ago and till now, most of the world's monogamous. But we weren't always, man. We weren't always. That's so interesting. I've, I, I definitely know people who, who, <laughs> who would feel that way. People who don't feel the need to be in a relationship. Mm-hmm. We're happy doing that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, it's a horrible stigma. Being polyamorous is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there is a stigma and it's a societal stigma going around it. And like I said earlier, what's going on in the bedroom of two cons- consenting adults is none of my business. And Kind of now there is kind of another revolution in that we're really yeah, figuring yeah. out about our past. And that mm-hmm. is creating this sort of polyamorous revolution. Yeah, man. So all to all to whoever wants to do that, have fun, enjoy your life. Yeah, man, that's that's yeah exactly. Enjoy your life, but that's so interesting. Like um, the standard sex drive and uh, drive of attraction is so strong, mm-hmm. and it's so sudden and it's quick. You know, it's quick. If um, like I, I I'm spitballing here, but I imagine if we were really evolved and really built to be monog- monogamous mm-hmm. we wouldn't have such a quick development of feelings for somebody yeah. like in the lustful stage in the early attraction stage you know when you're with someone for a couple of weeks and it's like a roller coaster of emotions that kind of thing yeah why would that happen if what you're looking for is a long term monogamous relationship you know mm-hmm. you wouldn't have that quick drive that often burns out. Interesting. The, 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 a lot of people call that the kind of honeymoon phase. like Exactly. But maybe that's actually the cycle. That's that's like the biologically built cycle for many people. Maybe the kind of conclusion from it, though, is that, yes, we're not biologically set up for monogamy. It's yeah. something that humans have to be aware of. And really yeah. have to work at, you know, in if you want to have a monogamous relationship, you best yeah, be aware it, of that fact and that history. For you know? sure. It is really biologically driven. Like uh, we've all kind of heard of our, you know, our sex hormones, like men classically get testosterone mm-hmm. and women classically get estrogen. Mm-hmm. And classically, we say that testosterone is the male one and estrogen is the female one. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it's not that straightforward because like. Women have testosterone and men have estrogen. Uh, They do. There's no doubt about it. And progesterone. These uh, hormones, they really determine your sex drive. Mm -hmm. They really are the great adjusters of your libido. And it's your hypothalamus in your brain, right, that organizes this and tells your um, sexual bits, your testes and your ovaries to start building these hormones. And that influences your sex drive. And they also found that increased testosterone in women is associated with a greater sex drive. So testosterone has that influence in both. Mm-hmm. And uh, and to correct myself there, estrogen is um, it, it's not necessarily as impactful on the sex drive, but a lot of women do report that depending on where they are in their menstrual cycle, it has an influence on their sex drive. Okay. So these sex hormones, they're really strong. <laughs> they're really strong, dude. Like they they really uh, are feeding into that very primal urge of you must reproduce. Mm-hmm. You know, like we think of ourselves as these deep, thoughtful creatures, these God's gift on earth <laughs> and we experience our life. But in reality, we just need to reproduce and move on. We're just promiscuous apes. So like that's kind of step one. That's that's what makes you go looking around. Um <laughs> And like we were saying with the honeymoon phase, where that that stage is interesting because it's not lust. The lust is done. Uh, it's happening. And we lust for a lot of people we are attracted to. But it can happen without the other. You can be attracted to someone but not particularly lustful after them. 
Yeah. Like you you don't have the same drive and you can be really lustful after someone without actually being attracted to the person. Interesting. It can kind of be both. And where attraction separates from lust, where lust is all sex hormones, attraction is much more about reward. Mm -hmm. So it's the same part of your brain that's involved in addiction. It makes you more excited and it makes you want more. It's a positive feedback loop. If you're attracted to someone, spending more time with them gives you a good feeling that makes you want to spend more time with them, which gives them you a good feeling. It's basically crack, okay? It's it's the same system. <laughs> and wow, I did not expect that. This system is kind of why the start of a relationship, this honeymoon phase, is such a ro roller coaster, right? Because the chemicals in the brain of dopamine and noradrenaline are really active in these stages and they make you feel excited and willing to take your risk, right? They're also like they help you take that jump. You know, when you're nervous and you do it, yeah. they help you take that jump. Mm -hmm. This can mess up a lot of things, though. Like it, it's not like, oh, great, happy, lovey, dovey. It, too much dopamine or too much noradrenaline leads to things like bad sleeping and bad eating. Like you lose, people lose their appetite mm -hmm. and people can't sleep as well. Too much of this in another areas, two other areas of the brain called the ventral tegmental area and the caudate nucleus, otherwise known as like the capitals of reward county, is oh. like in these areas, it can mess up another hormone, uh, serotonin, which is super involved in a few mental health disorders like depression. Wow. But an interesting thing, right, is that what this overactivity mm -hmm. of dopamine and noradrenaline does is it actually reduces serotonin, right? And an interesting thing about this, you know what other disorder is associated with low serotonin other than depression, but obsessive compulsive disorder, right? So okay. the theory going when you're in this attractive attraction phase, this honeymoon phase, you're thinking about this person a lot. You want to talk, message them. You're obsessing over things. You're literally thinking back, God, should I have sent that message? God, they must think I'm stupid. <laughs> oh, they yeah. they must be thinking that. And you're thinking of what might happen tomorrow, right? We're meeting up. What will we, What will I do? Okay, left foot first, right foot after. Okay, we'll do that. We'll go to a mo go, go to the movie. Will I put my arm around her? Oh, I don't know. And <laughs> that, that kind of obsessive behavior involved in this honeymoon phase and these early phases is it has a bit of a parallel doesn't it with o OCD it just kind of shows that like just like addiction you can burn out you can have these downsides happen and the last thing I will say that I love right is that when you're really really lovey-dovey like pure honeymoon phase really <laughs> happy happy that dopamine and noradrenaline arousal actually inhibits the activity of other parts of the brain, which make you think about yourself, oh God. which might make you think about, let's say, you'd be less worried about embarrassing yourself and you'd be less able to think. So in this lovey-dovey phase, you're literally, you're dumbed down. It's like being drunk. Literally, you are existing in a love hormone soup. And you, you aren't really yourself. And people who have been in relationships and they didn't want to leave, but then they did leave. And then a few years later, they're looking back and they're like, oh, my God, what was I doing to myself? <laughs> this is exactly what it is. Yeah. You're, you're not thinking clearly. Even if everywhere else in your world, you're thinking clearly and you're working hard and you're being successful. When you're with that person... You, your brain doesn't work the same way. It's different. Crazy. You're like a, it's like being addicted to each other. And a lot of that happens in toxic relationships as well, mm -hmm. where the, you, you move beyond that. And it's like not being able to get off a drug because you don't know how you'll handle being without it. And your brain's going haywire. It's giving you reward signals and depression signals all at the same time yeah. and telling you, I just don't can't stop. believe that it reduces serotonin. I thought serotonin was also a love drug. So serotonin is, it's more of a content drug. It makes and, uh, you not content. It makes you want to keep going and keep yeah. trying. 
yeah, there's a little bit of increased motivation. You need wow. to keep working at that. Like people in long term secure relationships, um, if it's a healthy relationship and both people help each other a lot and all that jazz, they would have high serotonin because they're content. They don't need to I see. keep pushing. But um, yeah, it is com- it's completely cuckoo. Uh, the fact that it turns down serotonin, which can be so easily connected to so many different things like obsessive compulsive disorder. The fact that all of this activity actually turns down your brain and makes you a bit more derpy. It makes and, you love drunk. And everybody, during this Valentine's week, we hope you have a great time, open a bottle of wine, get yourself an extra scoop of ice cream, and have at it. This is the end of the podcast We hope you enjoy your time If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned why don't you give us some money? Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. To all those boys and girls out there who listen to this podcast and they love what they hear, Join our goddamn Patreon.